You have achieved a penetrating precision in combat. <laughs> All right. Hello players and GMs and welcome to another video by Jetpack7. As you can see, we're doing something a little bit different today. I'm not in the big studio space. I don't have a super fancy backdrop. I just have a few books and a dragon egg. Today, I decided to do something a little bit different and I'm going to go through some of the Unearthed Arcana stuff. I've had some of my friends tell me that I really, really need to check this stuff out. They've been asking to use it in my games. So I decided to take a look at it and I figured why not make a video while I'm doing it and film my reaction. Before we get started, I want to remind you to please like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Every single contribution to this page helps us out a mile. And also, uh, speaking of Unearthed Arcana doing some playtime stuff. We have our own playtest environment that just recently opened up this past Monday called The Arsenal. If you haven't heard about that already, I'll put the link to that video in the description box below so you can go check that out. Essentially, it's a free PDF that you can download. It has some new content on it that we'll be adding to every week or so and hopefully tweaking it and making it better and more refined as time goes on. But to avoid this video being too, too long, I am going to go ahead and get started. The UA that I will be looking at is all these new feats. There are 16 brand new feats that Wizards of the Coast has just uh, put into playtest. And some of them seem pretty cool. I haven't really looked at the document yet. So I wanted this to be kind of a brand new, fresh look at something that I haven't really seen before. All right, so to start off, the first one they have is Artificer Initiate. You've learned some of an artificer's inventiveness, granting you the following benefits. You learn one cantrip of your choice from the artificer spell list, and you learn one first level spell of your choice from that list. Also, intelligence is your spellcasting ability for these spells. Whenever you gain a level, you can replace one of these spells with another spell of the same level from the artificer spell list. You can cast this feat's first level spell without a spell slot, and you must finish a long rest before you can cast it in this way again. You can also cast the spell using any spell slots you have. Uh, you gain proficiency with one type of artisan's tools of your choice, and you can use that type of tool as a spellcasting focus for any spell you cast that uses intelligence as its spellcasting ability. Okay, so from what I'm gathering looking at this feed, it essentially feels like Wizards is trying to give you like a one level dip into Artificer without you actually having to dip into Artificer with multiclassing. They are allowing you to take one of the cantrips and one of the spells, and then uh, they're also allowing you to use that as a... Uh, they're allowing you to cast that with one of your spell slots if you are an artificer already, I think. And then they're giving you proficiency with one type of artisan's tools, uh, which if you've looked at the artificer class, then you know that's a pretty big part of the class, is creating things and making stuff with all the different artisan's tools in the game. Pretty cool. Uh, I, I think I like where that's going. Uh, it kind of eliminates the need to multi-class, which is something that I think I'd like to see more of. Uh, I guess we'll see if there's more of those in here. I'm assuming there will be. Next up is the Chef. Increase your constitution or wisdom score by 1 to a maximum of 20. You gain proficiency with cook's utensils if you don't already have it. As a part of a short rest, you can cook special food, provided you have ingredients and cook's utensils on hand. You can prepare enough of this food for a number of creatures equal to four, plus your proficiency bonus. At the end of the short rest, any creature who eats the food and spends one or more hit dice to regain hit points regains an extra 1d8 hit points. That's pretty cool. With one hour of work or when you finish a long rest, you can cook a number of treats equal to your proficiency bonus. These special treats last eight hours after being made. A creature can use a bonus action to eat one of those treats to gain temporary uh, temporary hit points equal to your proficiency bonus. Oh. Oh, that's really good, actually. So, first of all, you get to increase your con and wisdom mod con or wisdom modifier by one, which is awesome. Uh, and then you get proficiency with cook's utensils, which is fine. Um, the short rest stuff is actually really good because that's essentially... I mean, that's a song of rest, basically, that you're getting, which uh, is something that only bards get otherwise. So that's actually a really, really strong thing. It adds a lot of efficiency to your uh, short rests and doesn't make people use as many hit dice. Uh, but the temp HP, using a bonus action to gain temp HP equal to your proficiency bonus is actually really freaking cool. Um, yeah, so you can actually hand out those treats, and then as a bonus action, those uh, whoever you gave the treats to can 
eat those and gain temp HP, which is pretty freaking dope. Most of the game, it would be around three temp HP. So that's not a whole lot, but for just kind of a free shield of hit points, I think that's pretty dang good. Crusher. Increase your strength or dexterity by one to a maximum of 20. First of all, I like the name of this one. Just really cut the BS here. Once per turn, when you hit a creature with an attack that deals bludgeoning damage, you can move it five feet to an unoccupied space, provided that target is no more than one size larger than you. When you score a critical hit that deals bludgeoning damage to a creature, attack rolls against that creature are made with advantage until the end of your next turn. Okay... So it's essentially just a, it's a feat that rewards you for specifically using weapons that use bludgeoning damage. So that's pretty good because it essentially allows you to disengage from that creature for free uh, once per turn, which is actually really freaking strong. Not to mention the additional thing you get whenever you crit against that creature attack rolls are made advantage are made with advantage until the end of your next turn. So you basically if you crit your whole next turn and the rest of your turn if you if you crit early enough, all of your attack rolls are at advantage. That's pretty good actually. Yeah, I don't know. I it's hard to say if that feat feels too strong. It doesn't feel it doesn't feel broken by any means, but I think maybe having both of these in one feet might be a little too strong. I'm not sure. I'd like to play test that one and and see put it putting it in practice because really you don't have that much of an opportunity to crit. Like critting isn't something that happens super duper regularly, so it's not like you would actually see that second bit of this feat very often. Um, so it would just kind of be a nice bonus. So I don't know. I, th I think I actually do like this feat. Um, increasing your strength or dex is obviously always a good thing. Next up is Eldritch Adept, uh, which requires spellcasting or pact magic. Uh, studying occult lore, you have unlocked Eldritch power within yourself. You learn one Eldritch invocation option of your choice from the Warlock class. Okay, so here we go. Now we're dipping into Warlock again. If the invocation has a prerequisite, you can choose that invocation only if you're a warlock and only if you meet the prerequisite. Whenever you gain a level, you can replace the invocation with another one from the warlock class. Oh, okay, so it's not even necessarily dipping into warlock uh, as much as it is just picking an invocation from the warlock class. So it's 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 a little bit like the uh, Artificer Initiate one that we saw before, where it's taking a very specific point of the Warlock class and probably the coolest part of the Warlock class and allowing you to pull from that without having to actually multi-class into Warlock, which is really, really strong. I, I like that one a lot, actually. I've done something very similar with one of my players where I gave them a feat that essentially gave them uh, either two castings of Subtle Spell or one casting of, I think it was Heightened Spell, um, per short rest or per long rest. So that was... Uh, that's that's really cool. I like that. Um, cool. Fey touched. Your exposure to the Fey Wild or one of its denizens has left a magical mark on you. You gain the following benefits. Increase your intelligence, wisdom, or charisma by one to a maximum of 20. That's nice. You learn the Misty Step spell and one first level spell of your choice. The first level spell must be from the Divination or Enchantment School of Magic. You can cast each of these spells without expending a spell slot. Once you cast either of these spells in this way, you can't cast it again until you finish a long rest. You can also cast these spells using spell slots you have the appropriate level. The spell spellcasting ability is the ability increased by this feet okay that's really nice uh misty step is one of my favorite spells in the game just anything that allows you to use a bonus action for one i love bonus action spells and then uh allowing you to move yourself around the battlefield without actually having to use your movement speed those kinds of spells feel really freaking good anything that increases your mobility feels really awesome so getting that for free is really dope uh, not to mention being able to increase your intelligence, wisdom, or charisma, and then learning a first level spell, and being able to cast it using any whatever ability you chose to increase. That's a really powerful feat, actually. Um, but it's definitely not too strong, uh, because you get a first level spell from it, you, get a, you can use Misty Step once per day without expending a spell slot, that's nothing crazy, or you can use Misty Step uh, using whatever spell slots you have. 
that's definitely not an OP feat by any means, in my opinion. Um, but it is strong, and it is definitely something you'd feel the effects of, which I think is ultimately the point of taking a feat. Fighting Initiate requires proficiency with a martial weapon. Your martial training has helped you develop a particular style of fighting. As a result, you learn one fighting style option of your choice from the fighter class. If you already have a style, the one you choose must be different. Whenever you gain a level, you can replace this feat's fighting style with another one from the fighter class that you don't have. Oh, okay. So this one is just allowing you to learn a fighting style, which is really freaking good. Because the fighter, if you've ever played any of the other martial classes, they do get fighting styles. Um, but they are much more limited than the fighter, which I believe gets access to all of the fighting styles. So essentially what this means is you, you can just play one of the other martial classes and then pick up that fighting style. So like if you wanted to play a paladin, paladins don't get access to dual wielding. But if you pick up a paladin and want to be a dual wielding paladin with this feat, you can do that. So that's really, really cool actually. And, uh, something I really enjoy because I never, there were certain classes that I didn't understand why they couldn't have certain fighting styles. It didn't quite make sense to me. Um, but this kind of opens those options up quite a bit, uh, but doesn't just give it to you for free, which I think is really cool. Gunner. All right, here we go. You have a quick hand and a keen eye when employing firearms, granting you the following benefits. Increase your dexterity score by 1 to a maximum of 20. Okay. You gain proficiency with firearms. Okay, you ignore the loading property of firearms. Interesting. And being within five feet of a hostile creature doesn't impose disadvantage on your ranged attack rolls. Oh, uh, so it's it's just crossbow expert, but with guns. <laughs> That's all that is. It's literally just crossbow expert with guns. You ignore the loading property. Uh, being within five feet of a creature doesn't impose disadvantage. Yeah, that's it. So it's, yeah, it's exactly the same thing as crossbow expert, just with guns instead, which are... Pretty much just reskinned ranged weapons a lot of the time. Meta magic adept. You've learned. Okay, so it requires spellcasting or pat, packed magic. Oh, haha. This is the thing. This is the thing that I was mentioning earlier. I've already done this with one of my players. I just got more specific with it. You've learned how to exert your will on your spells to alter how they function. You gain the following benefits. You learn two metamagic options of your choice from the sorcerer class. You can use only one metamagic option on a spell when you cast it, unless the option says otherwise. Whenever you gain a level, you can replace one of your metamagic options with another one from the sorcerer class. You gain two sorcery points to spend on metamagic. These points are added to any sorcery points you have from another source, but can be used only on metamagic. You regain all spent sorcery points when you finish a long rest. So, okay, yeah, so it's exactly, it's very similar to what I was doing, not exactly like what I was doing. Um, you gain two sorcery points to spend on metamagic, which is pretty limiting. Um, that essentially means you can learn two metamagic options, which means you'll never be able to cast heightened spell which ca uh, costs three sorcery points if you aren't already a sorcerer uh, but if you are a sorcerer then you just straight up gain two more sorcery points and then you can learn two more meta magic options i think yeah yeah i would think that based on the wording of this it leads me to believe that you could actually as a sorcerer learn two additional meta magic options and then gain two additional sorcery points on top of that which you can use to uh the, but you would have to kind of separately track those because those two sorcery points can't be used to regain spell slots they can only be used for meta magic so you'd kind of have to track those two sorcery points separately i like this feat yeah i, I i'm liking actually where they're going with all of these where they kind of add that ability to get features from other classes without actually fully investing in a multi-class option because there are some multi-classing options that really heighten the strength of your character and then there are certain other options that just kind of limit your character and slow down the growth of your character they give you those options that the other class has but a lot of the time you just want to keep building into your main class because they have features coming up that you really want to get access to so this kind of gives you that, all of these different feats kind of give you that ability without slowing down your growth as a character, which I really enjoy. Piercer, I'm guessing this is like Crusher, but with Pokey. 
You have achieved a penetrating precision in combat. <laughs> All right. Granting you the following benefits. Increase your strength or dexterity by 1 to a maximum of 20. Once per turn, when you hit a creature with an attack that deals piercing damage, you can re-roll one of the attack's damage dice, and you must use the new roll. When you score a critical hit that deals piercing damage to a creature, you can roll one additional damage die when determining the extra piercing damage the target takes. Okay, so... Yeah, so this is like Crusher, where it, it benefits you from using uh, for using a specific type of damaging weapon. Um, once per turn, when you hit a creature with an attack that deals piercing damage. Okay, so it allows you to re-roll that damage die if you want, and then whenever you crit, you essentially get a Brutal Critical added onto it. My only complaint about this is the pun at the beginning. I think they just need to avoid... <laughs> that word poisoner you can prepare and deliver deadly poisons gaining the following benefits when you make a damage roll you ignore resistance to poison damage okay that's really good uh, you can coat a weapon and poison as a bonus action instead of an action you gain proficiency with the poisoner's kit if you don't already have it with one hour of work using a poisoner's kit and expending 50 gold pieces worth of material you can create a number of doses of potent poison equal to your proficiency bonus once applied the poison retains potency for one minute or until you hit with the weapon when a when a weapon coated in this poison deals damage to a creature that creature must succeed on a dc 14 constitution saving throw or take 2d8 poison damage and become poisoned until the end of your next turn Okay, so that was a lot of words. Essentially, all this means is that when you deal poison damage, you ignore resistance to poison, which is already really crazy. Um, you can code a weapon and poison as a bonus action rather than an action, which is really, really nice uh, because one big thing holding back people from using poison more on their weapons is that they can't really do it in combat without reducing, without using one of their actions. Um, Generally speaking, when you are in combat, you don't get as much value out of it unless you have a really, really powerful poison that you want to put on your weapon that will actually make up for the fact that you sacrificed a full action to do damage, especially since rogues really like this. Rogues like to coat in poison, and the fact that they don't get to do an action which will reduce their sneak attack damage, um, they, don't, they don't really like to do that. So being able to do it as a bonus action is really strong. And then essentially what this last paragraph means is you can make a poison. Uh, there's a obviously the poisons list um, that you can find, I think, in the DMG or the Player's Handbook. Um, if you just Google poisons 5e, it'll come up. Um, this is just a different type of poison that isn't on that list. You can make a poison specific to you. It deals 2d8 damage, uh, 2d8 poison damage, DC 14 con save, and then they become poisoned until the end of your next turn so it's nothing crazy strong um but it's really nice that you can have uh it has what three doses of it okay so you uh, equal to your proficiency bonus so early on yeah it'll be two or three doses and then um you can code it as a bonus action so this feat really synergizes really well with itself um the one thing <laughs> that's actually pretty strong is if if you have spell casting and you can cast a really powerful poison damage spell like uh i don't even know if you can cast a really powerful poison damage spell then you ignore poison resistance which is crazy because poison damage and poison resistance are some of the most common uh damages and resistance types in the game especially when it comes to monsters and uh, different creatures that you'd be fighting so being able to ignore that resistance is really really strong uh this feat is incredibly powerful and i think i don't know if i i don't know if i think it's broken because poisons just are used so infrequently from my experience, even when I've given my players poison, they oftentimes forget to use it. Um, but I think taking this feat would make it to where they definitely don't forget to use it. Because at that point, it's become a pretty crucial part of your character. So I think this feat's actually really, really nice. Um, maybe a little bit on the strong side. I think maybe a, one of these features could be taken away. But... Otherwise, I think it's really good. I think if if there was one thing I were to take away, it would be the ignoring poison resistance, because even though that feels really freaking good, uh, 
the other stuff more than makes up for that being gone being able to coat your weapon I, I think the intention of this feat is to be used for someone who's coating a weapon in poison that seems to be the case um, since the second and third feet both would require you to do that but the first feat or the first part of this feat kind of is very broad it's a very broad stroke that covers a lot of bases and i i think that might just be a little unnecessary and maybe a little bit overtuned but otherwise i really like this feat practiced expert you have honed your proficiency with particular skills or tools gaining the following benefits increase one ability score of your choice by one okay that's actually really good uh, a feat that allows you to just straight up increase any of your ability scores by one is really really good you gain proficiency with one skill or tool of your choice. Choose one of the choose one of your skill or tool proficiencies. Your proficiency bonus. Okay, so you gain expertise basically in that in that skill. Wow. Okay, so this essentially just gives you plus one to any attribute of your choice. You gain proficiency with one skill, and then you can also become you can gain expertise in any of those skills or tool proficiencies that you already have including, I'm guessing, the one that you just became proficient in. That is... That's uh, that's really, really good, actually. Um, expertise is crazy. Anyone who's played a bard or a rogue knows that expertise is absolutely insane. So this feat, just giving you proficiency in one thing and expertise in another, is really, really good. Um, don't think it's too strong by any means. I think investing a feat in getting expertise is definitely... Um, a, a trade-off for sure based on how powerful the rest of the feats are in the game um so definitely don't think it's too strong but i think I, I like this feat a lot because it really opens up the options and i'm a sucker for skills and tool proficiencies because bard is my favorite class so shadow touched you learn how to bend shadows from your experience with the shadow fell you gain the following benefits increase your intelligence wisdom or charisma score by one okay you learn the darkness spell and one first level spell of your choice. The first level spell must be from the illusion or necromancy schools of magic. You can cast each of these spells without expending a spell slot, blah, 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 blah. We've seen this exact feat before uh, with the, what was it? Fey touched. So it's essentially the exact same thing as Fey touched, but just um, edgy instead. Uh, it just uses shadowy stuff. So it's darkness instead of misty step, but otherwise it's exactly the same. And the skill or the spells you have to choose are from either illusion or necromancy rather than um, divination or enchantment. So yeah, it's it's exactly the same thing. Um, the darkness spell is one of my favorites because it just causes absolute chaos on the battlefield, especially when no one can see through it. So it's. <laughs> This feat in particular, I think, is the exact same. Yeah, it's exactly the same as that one, so I have no issues with it. It doesn't break the game by any means. Um, opens up some options and, again, increases ability scores, which is great. Shield training. You've trained in the effective use of shields. You gain the following benefits. Increase your strength, dexterity, or constitution score by 1 to a maximum of 20. You gain proficiency with shields. In combat, you can don or doff a shield as the free object interaction on your turn. That's nice. If you have the spellcasting or packed magic feature, you can use a shield as the spellcasting focus. Oh. This is really strong. Yeah, this is actually insane. So, at base... For one, a shield is just going to straight up increase your AC by two. So if you're a spellcaster, you're usually really freaking squishy and you have to rely on mage armor. So a wizard can use a shield with this feat. <laughs> and uh, you can increase your con by one or dex by one, which would be great for either a wizard or... Uh, really any caster because they want good decks and good con you gain proficiency with a shield so you can just increase your ac by two in combat you can put it on or take it off as a free object interaction which is really really nice because um one of the biggest things i just kind of don't really track too much in uh when i'm running a game is uh sheathing or unsheathing weapons so donning and doffing armor and stuff like that that kind of 
goes on the back burner a lot of the time when I'm running the game because I don't feel like tracking it and I don't enjoy having to <clears throat> use actions and bonus actions and stuff to uh, put on or off armor and weapons, which I just oftentimes assume are drawn when combat is beginning. This one kind of opens up that option a little bit so that you can just put your shield on or take it off as a free object interaction rather than as an action or a bonus action. And then you can, the, the actually, the, probably the strongest part of this entire thing is that you can use your shield as a spellcasting focus. So any of your casters don't have to take um, a warcaster. They don't have to be able to cast with weapons in their hand. So you can actually have the shield on and have the, your open hand to do whatever somatic components you need to do. Plus, that'll stack with mage armor. So your AC will become, what is it, 13 plus your spellcasting modifier if you have mage armor. And then you can add two from your shield as well. And then you can use your shield as a spellcasting focus. So this is basically just saying, I want to increase my AC by two. That's really, really good. Um, there are a lot of spellcasting classes that would benefit from this. Uh, there are a lot of, obviously, cleric domains that are already proficient in shields. But other than cleric, there aren't many casters that are proficient in shield. I think maybe druids are, if I'm not mistaken. But, like, wizards aren't, sorcerers aren't, and they are the two squishiest classes. And so being able to just run around with a shield on, not to mention some of the magic shields are really, really strong. Being able to just run around with a shield on is a pretty big bonus. Um, oftentimes, the, the benefit that you get from mage armor would be right around, like, two higher than you would just from base AC if your dexterity is high enough. So um, that's that's really good. Slasher. Guessing this is one is about slashing weapons. You've learned where to cut to have the greatest results, granting you the benefits. The following benefits. Strength reduced by 1 to a maximum of 20. Once per turn, when you hit a creature with an attack that deals slashing damage, you can reduce the speed of the target by 10 feet until the start of your next turn. When you score a critical hit that deals slashing damage to a creature, you grievously wound it until the start of your next turn. The target has disadvantage on all attack rolls. Okay. So this is kind of the opposite of the crusher feet. The crusher feet where you're hitting them with a hammer and sending them back five feet. This one, you slash them, you kind of hamstring them, essentially, and they uh, have ten less movement speed until the start of your next turn. Um, if you've ever played a character and had your freaking speed reduced, it is actually the most frustrating thing in the world. Um, if you have a wizard in your party and you're a DM and they cast slow on a group of your monsters, you know how freaking terrible that feels. And then when you score a critical hit that deals slashing damage, they have disadvantage on all of their attack rolls until the start of your next turn. So their entire next turn, uh, they will have disadvantage on every attack roll. And that's not... There's no saving throw involved in that. So that would work on creatures with like legendary resistances and stuff like that. So th this would work on a boss, which could be really, really debilitating and really terrible to play against as a DM, actually. Um, so maybe if I were to change anything about these feats, um, the ones that apply different things, like this one isn't terrible, just dealing a little bit of extra damage. Um, Crusher isn't terrible because it gives you advantage on your attack rolls. So I think with this one, if I were to change anything about it, I'd give maybe a constitution saving throw in there based on, I don't know, 8 plus whatever attribute you increased with the feat. Um, and then plus your proficiency modifier to determine the DC. And then let them make that con save. And then if they fail, they have disadvantage on all their attack rolls for the next turn. Or maybe that's unnecessary and you can just keep that on there. I'm not sure. But off the top of my head, if I were a DM and someone crit on my boss and he had disadvantage on all of his attacks for the next turn, I'd be pretty sad. But I guess that's, you know, the life and times of a DM is just feeling sad when your players ruin your boss encounters. Tandem Tactician. All right. Your presence in a scrap tends to elevate your comrades. You gain the following benefits. You can use the help action as a bonus action. Ah, okay. So we're getting into, um, what is it? Uh, Mastermind Rogue. 
here. When you use the help action to aid an ally in attacking a creature, increase the range of the help action by 10 feet. Additionally, you can help two allies targeting the same creature within range when you... Oh, that's really good. You can help two allies. Okay, so the help action normally has to be in melee range. Um, and it takes an action. So you have to be in melee range of your ally who you are helping to attack a creature. I think. Let me actually look this up. Dash, disengage, help. Okay, help action. You can lend your aid to another creature in the completion of a task. When you take the help action, the creature you aid gains advantage on the next ability check it makes to perform the task you're helping with, provided that it makes the check before the start of your next turn. Alternatively, you can aid a friendly creature in attacking a creature within five feet of you. Okay. So yeah, you have to be within five feet of the targeted creature that the, your allies are attacking. So you can... Normally, you have to be in melee range of that five, within five feet of that creature that your allies are attacking. But this feat allows you to be within ten feet rather than five, and you can help two allies targeting the same creature within range. So, instead of granting uh, aid on just instead of granting help on just the one attack in the next attack, you can help the next two attacks essentially. So your one ally can attack them once. I don't know. That's odd. It's odd. To, it's an odd wording because um, if your ally attacks the target before your next turn, the first attack roll is made with advantage. So I guess the first attack that each ally makes is at advantage with this one. The, the wording is a little bit odd because it doesn't completely line up with the wording of the help action. Because the help action, you're not really helping a single ally. You're just helping the next ally. That attacks them so it's a little odd um, I'd maybe shift around that wording just to make it line up a little bit more with the help action um, but otherwise I like the feat I like the intended use of this feat um, the mastermind rogue obviously can help as a bonus action but from 30 feet away um, so this one's a little bit less than that but allows you to help essentially twice rather than once with that action which is really really strong and a fun way to use your bonus action and the final one is Tracker. You have spent time hunting creatures and honed your skills, gaining the following benefits. Increased your wisdom score by 1 to a maximum of 20. You learn the Hunter's Mark spell. Mm, here we go. You can cast it once without expending a spell slot, and you must finish a long rest. And then you can cast it if you have the spell slots as well. Wisdom is your spell casting ability. You, can have, you have advantage on survival checks to track creatures, just in general. You have advantage on survival checks to track creatures. Okay. This one is really, really good because uh, if you took this as a ranger, you could actually just cast Hunter's Mark uh, once per long rest for free without expending a spell slot. And I like that a lot because one of the biggest limitations to me as a ranger, uh, because I actually really like playing rangers, I love the thematic nature of rangers, but they just feel incredibly freaking weak. So being able to cast Hunter's Mark for free and learning it without having to take a spell slot from it is really nice because it's essentially just an innate it feels almost just like a specific ranger spell. It feels like it shouldn't belong in any other spell uh, or in any other spell book. So being able to get it for free and being able to cast it um, without expending a spell slot is really nice. And then obviously getting advantage on tracking creatures is dope as well. But the, also being able to take this as like a, a fighter or... Uh, I don't know, a Warlock. I mean, you could take it as a Warlock and get Hunter's Mark. Granted, they have Hex already, so I guess that's not a big deal. But either way, this is nice. Um, another kind of way to dip into Ranger a little bit without actually being a Ranger. So this is another another one of those feats that kind of dip into another class. And that is all the feats, actually. So um, overall, I really like this. Um, these feats are all really unique compared to some of the feats that are currently in 5th edition. I love the emphasis that they're putting on gaining the ability to kind of multi-class, essentially, without, without fully multi-classing. That is something that I felt was lacking in D&D, &D, um, or in 5e specifically, 
Uh, some of the some of my favorite archetypes for certain classes was when they were kind of a mix of, uh, for example, the um, the scout, the scout rogue. Yeah, I think it's yeah. <laughs> yeah, see, I couldn't even remember what class it was because it's a mix of rogue and ranger essentially. Um, so I, I really like those archetypes that bring in other classes and kind of mix up the pot a little bit and give you the features that you can get from multi-classing into another class, but without having to actually slow down your progression at the class that you started out as. So these feats, a lot of them I really, really enjoy. Um, some of them maybe just with slight tweaks that I mentioned in there, here and there. Um, but otherwise they feel pretty balanced. Um... I'm actually going to look up who, who did these uh, so that we can credit these folks. Um, so it looks like for this Unearthed Arcana, we have, um, sorry if I butcher your names, Tamor, uh, Tamor Remen, Jeremy Crawford, uh, Ben Petrosor, Dan Dillon, and Ari Levich. Um, looks like uh, those were the folks who worked on this Unearthed Arcana in particular, and it looks like they actually did some of the uh, revisited subclasses. So... I like this writing team. Uh, keep an eye on these writers because they have uh, produced some of my favorite Unearthed Unearth Arcana stuff to date. And uh, hopefully this continues along this path. And I look forward to seeing these in a book. Um, I said it when I was reviewing the uh, psionic classes as, or the psionic subclasses that they introduced in the previous Unearthed Arcana. Um, it seems like they're gearing up for another big player book release another big player content release uh which i think is a little overdue we've gotten a couple we're getting uh rhyme of the frost maiden coming up we've got a couple campaign settings that are coming up but it's been a little bit since we've had a fully player focused book and that is really what fuels D, &D because you know it's all about it's all about the players the dms can do whatever they want the gms can run the game however they want in whatever setting they want Oftentimes, it's just a homebrew setting, um, but really what fuels the growth of this is adding player options, and so that is what they're doing with these feats, and I really, really enjoy that because multi-classing can get a little confusing sometimes, especially when you start to multi-class between casting classes. That's still something I don't even fully understand because I've not tried it because it is just confusing to me, but these feats I really like, and... I can't wait to see them get fully printed and finalized into a book. But that's all there is for this Unearthed Arcana review. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and call it at that. Thank you all very, very much for watching. Remember to visit our website, jetpack7.com. I will put the link below so that you can access the arsenal, our newest playtest environment, so that you can see stuff kind of like this and then hopefully bring that to your table. Uh, you can join our Discord channel after that and tell me how great or awful everything is that I've written into there. So uh, be sure to check that out. We are also still doing our giveaway uh, in the same video where I talk about the arsenal. I talk about the giveaway, so that video tells you how to enter and hopefully win some free stuff from us. So go ahead and check that out and good luck. Next week, I will be returning to the analytics and going back to ranking the different class archetypes with the fighter. And this is one that I've looked at quite a bit already, so I've already got some preconceived notions about how those might go, but I look forward to fully deciding on that ranking and sharing it with you all. But until then, thank you all very much for watching, and I'll see you around.